depending on where the world, where in the world you are. It is Peak Off Wednesday. Already see unsigned 32-bit individualist in the chat. And I want you to shout it out. If you are in the chat, if you are joining us live, I want to hear, where are you? I love these discussions, worldwide discussions, important discussions about Ayn Rand's ideas as brought to us by the man, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, and his book, his, his volume here, Keeping It Real, Bringing Ideas Down to Earth. I am joined, as always, by the man, the expert, James, James Valiant. How are you doing this fine Wednesday morning? I am doing most excellently, sir. Thank you. Um, and to everyone out there, uh, buenos dias, uh, bonjour, guten tag. Howdy. <laughs> it is great that we have a worldwide audience. And uh, that is something special we do here at the Ayn Rand Center UK. So please join us uh, with in the chat with super chats. Uh, hit like, subscribe, share, comment. All of that helps. So welcome to another uh, Peak Off Wednesday. Now, James, this week, and, and I'm appreciating this as we come down from the Valentine's holiday, we're going from romance to art. Well, almost the same topic there. But big questions in literature. We've addressed some of these before. And the last time we had this yes. conversation, the way in which these ideas were brought down to earth hit me hard. We've even talked about some of the literature I haven't yet taken in in my life, classics I need to consume. And some questions that Leonard Peikoff has asked that relate to that. How is it that some of us, some of us who take art and ideas very seriously, and yeah, have a bit of a gap there. We need to talk about this. We need to talk this week. So I want to jump right in. Well, first, I want to jump right in and say, good morning, Roland Horvath, who is in with a super chat, says, howdy from Gibraltar. I want to hear where in the world you are, and I appreciate that. Roland, your super chat, any super chats that come in, support the Ayn Rand Center UK. Keep programs like this happening. Keep things happening behind the scenes. Thank you for that. We have a different producer this morning. I want to welcome Irene to to the, the production staff here. I mentioned that especially because Daniel is in the chat as well and says, wow, 10 months, keep it real. So thank you to those of you behind the scenes. Let me jump into the topic. We're gonna to talk more about ARC UK and supporting us, but I love to see those super chats. Leonard Peikoff was asked this question and this kicks us off in the topic of literature, art, the relationship to philosophy and Ayn Rand's novels. Do great works of art such as those of Homer, or Victor Hugo, or Ayn Rand, tend to inspire philosophical movements? Or is it the reverse? Now, James, you and I have talked about this, the question of which is fundamental, art or philosophy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love Leonard Peikoff's answer here, because I, I think if you pick either one of those without going into some context, you've given a simplistic answer. Dr. Peikoff would never do that. He starts off his answer this way. He says, I would say it works in both directions, but the philosophy inspiring the art is primary. Now, that's how Dr. Peikoff starts out. And right away, that just gets the wheels in my head turning. Uh, for example, then, is it is it always that way? Is it mutually reinforcing or is it more of a spiral history akin to the spiral theory of knowledge? He goes on to say Homer rested on a certain kind of philosophy, namely secularism, as his basic outlook, which is what made the whole Greek civilization. If you say Homer was the philosopher who originated a secular approach, well, that's great, and it makes him the genius of the universe, but then he was the philosopher who made possible a secular philosophy that made possible a work of art, unquote Leonard Peikoff. James, uh, again, right away, it would have been all too easy for Dr. Peikoff to point out, and it would have been true to say, well, philosophy is primary. But no, that's right. not, that's simplistic. That's not how it plays out. Right. It is true that philosophy drives history, but I'm loving well, this I mean, answer. I think we have to say that as a matter of historical fact, before human beings got to the point where they could do self-conscious philosophy, and frankly, before the ancient Greeks, the human beings weren't doing uh, philosophy in any real self-critical, rational sense with an objective methodology or a secular approach, as Dr. Peikoff alludes to here. It was the Greeks who gave us self-conscious philosophy, but the Greeks didn't get to, you know, even sophism, much less Plato and Aristotle, overnight. They had a culture, they had a literature 
and a psychological outlook that preceded that. Now, whether Homer was instrumental in developing that or was himself just inheriting that, as a matter of historical fact, I think literature comes first. Literature is the first way in which people are uh, mentally playing with philosophy and testing it out from real world situations, from real world contexts, from working out this story. Uh, you know, so as a matter of history, uh, I think that first you have literature, forms of literature, uh, and then you have self-conscious philosophy because you inductively have to develop enough facts, you know, to get to the ideas. And the way you do that is situationally. What would happen to this character under well, Achilles? Let's take Homer. Achilles, if his honor is, uh, you know, threatened by Agamemnon but under the walls of Troy or something, uh, you see. Uh, but on the other hand, he's right. Ideas are more primary. And in the case, I mean, it can't be an accident, for example, that all these Greek uh, writers shared a, some substantially similar uh, values to Homer. It was the whole culture. It's not just Homer, it's Sophocles, the playwright, or Euripides, the playwright. These artists are also expressing the values that ancient Greece uh, apparently uh, were primary, the values that were primary for ancient Greece. Now, on the other hand, there, you know, Ayn Rand said that, you know, she had two tasks. Usually an artist can assume a set of values in a culture, take Victor Hugo. Uh, he was a socialist, uh, he was a Christian. I do not read uh, Victor Hugo for that. I read Victor Hugo to experience his magnificent sense of humanity, his, his amazing sense of how humans are this glorious, noble creature that have control over their lives. I get his deeper metaphysical sense of life from it. That's why I read Hugo. And Hugo was simply accepting the ideas of his time. Ayn Rand realized she couldn't simply accept the philosophy of her time. So she had to both be an original artist and develop art that was an end in itself in contemplation, but also she had to explain a radically new philosophy in the process. So when I read Ayn Rand, there's kind of two tracks that I'll read an Ayn Rand novel on. One is simply to get into her universe and ex emotionally experience it as the art that it is, because that's in her mind, the function of art, to emotionally experience our metaphysical values. But then there are times I admit that I will pick up Atlas Shrugged, especially the speeches, but also some other subtle points where I'm learning a whole new philosophy that's being explained uh, here. So uh, because she realized she had to sort of do both, create a whole new uh, philosophy to underlie uh, this art. And in her mind, art is not didactic in purpose. I hope I <laughs> let me just shut up there. <laughs> Well, it makes perfect sense. And you, you've you given much of Leonard Pigott's answer. I'll skip to the end where he says, well, I would say this. Art is the greatest disseminator of philosophy that there is. It can produce a cultural effect that philosophical lectures cannot do. Take Uncle Tom's Cabin and the fight against slavery. That book did more than a thousand tracts against slavery ever did. It's still true, though that you can't have the art that's so influential without the philosophy that makes it possible. And that immediately took me to Ayn Rand and the Romantic Manifesto and the psychoepistemology of art. We will talk about, there are folks who come into objectivism with more of a, a literature, more of an art approach. And there are other folks who immediately read the nonfiction and say, that's all I need. And one book that is nonfiction, but sometimes is not given the attention it deserves, by the nonfiction types is the Romantic Manifesto. Oh, very Ayn much. One of, the of greatest, one of the greatest philosophical books ever written, a revolution in so many ways. It has applicability beyond this, but you know, for centuries, in effect, human beings were trying to figure out what art is, why do humans engage in it, what is its psychological function, and Ayn Rand in my view, is the first person that gave a good uh, reality-based answer to that, uh, that actually explains the psychological function of art for me and I know everyone I know. Uh, but it also has applications much, much broader. You know, people get bogged down 
one of the distressing things about a lot of the way people discuss the Romantic Manifesto in my mind, I hope I can make this little uh, postscript, they'll get bogged down in Ayn Rand's own evaluation of particular works of art or particular artists, and they can't get off that. If Ayn Rand had a, you know, for example, had a view of Rembrandt versus a view of, of Vermeer, and that, uh, some some great artist thinks, oh no, Rembrandt was a great artist. Why why is Ayn Rand doing dissing yeah. Rembrandt and praising Vermeer so? Um, yeah. you, you know, uh, whatever you know, whatever your view of a work by uh, uh, Rembrandt, and I'm not saying he wasn't a technical genius. Of course, he was. It's not it, that that your response to that work of art is not what Ayn Rand is even talking about. You may have perfectly valid reasons why that particular portrait of Rembrandt emotionally affects you. What I urge people to do is look at her reasons, look at the logic behind it. And, uh, you know, frankly, I'll, I, I do agree with her general perspective. So the reason why I'll read Atlas Shrugged purely for aesthetic reasons is so that I can experience a psychoepistemology like Vermeer's where there's this hyper-reality, this clarity uh, that uh, stylistically she brings to literature as Vermeer brings to painting. So I can see the connection there. This does not mean to say that if she thought Shakespeare was, you know, and you know, didn't know how to handle plot themes properly and was a determinist, uh, that's true. But there are still so many ways in which I can enjoy Shakespeare plays. There are some Shakespeare plays I just love listening to. He was a brilliant poet. Uh, and so uh, I urge people, whatever their disagreements with Ayn Rand about Beethoven or Rembrandt or Shakespeare, uh, consider her reasons for her theory of art. And you'll find that this is one of the most important uh, nonfiction books ever written, in my view. Yeah. And art is so personal that I, I, I've seen that before, that reaction. Yeah. When Ayn Rand uses specific examples. If you need an antidote to that, Read the Copper Pot story in Facets of Ayn Rand, or or the episode on Copper Pot Objectivism that I and Amy Amy Nacer have done, or just listen to Yaren Brook talk about his love of Beethoven, and you realize even though Ayn Rand had her criticisms of these artists and their method and their psychoepistemology, that is that does not in any way take away from the genius, from the brilliance, from what they achieved, and from what you can take away from it. But yeah. It, Exactly right. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. We have, we have a super chat from Jeff Bannister, always one of the great supporters of ARC UK and always right. appreciated. And some of what Jonathan Honig would call the philosophy posse are in the house. Emmanuel is in the chat. Apollo Zeus is in as well. And Emmanuel says, the romantic manifesto went over my head. LOL laughs about that. And I get it. I totally understand that. But I would encourage you to revisit the book as often as it takes for you to say, oh, wait, I get it, because it will happen. You will say, oh, I get it now. And especially those first few chapters, art and sense of life, and especially the psychoepistemology of art. Here, here, let me give you a quote from the psychoepistemology of art that will give you an overview of what we're talking about today. Just real quick from Ayn Rand, art is the indispensable medium for the communication of a moral ideal. This does not mean that art is a substitute for philosophic thought. Without a conceptual theory of ethics, an artist would not be able to successfully concretize an image of the ideal. But without this assistance of art, ethics remains in the position of theoretical engineering. Art is the model builder. But, but then she goes on, well, I won't go on because there's there's more for you to read and more for you to understand, but that makes a point Ooh, that we're gonna cover God. today. Look, consider Uncle Tom's cabin there. Yeah. You know, really good arguments against slavery began uh, some serious ones during the Enlightenment from philosophers like John Locke. And they were picked up by other Enlightenment philosophers in the 18th century, including many of America's founding fathers, by the way, embraced that attack on slavery. Uh, you know, uh, people will always talk about, you know, slavery being the reason for America. No, I mean, you don't put in your Declaration of Independence that everyone is created equal with equal rights, uh, uh, point blank. And, and you know, that's consistent with Jefferson's actual 
idealistic goal of getting rid of slavery. And Lincoln used those very ideas as the moral justification for getting rid of slavery during the Civil War. But we needed that philosophy. We needed the John Locke's. We needed the philosophers to argue that. What Uncle Tom's Cabin did, though, is it brought the emotional reality of the case against slavery to the ordinary American. And so it had a very powerful impact, not just in the Northeast, where slavery was already condemned by so many people, but throughout the country. Uh, it even had penetration in the South, where people were wondering, you know, wow, this was a very powerful book. Now, in some sense, uh, uh, the idea there was somewhat didactic. You want to make the point slavery is really bad in a vivid way by telling the story right, of a particular family uh, trying to escape slavery and what they had to endure and stuff, that it gives you the emotional reality of the horrors of slavery in a way that no non you know, one philosophical, however brilliant Locke's treatment was, but John Locke's critique of slavery came first. <laughs> There's a clear example of philosophers making arguments against slavery, preparing the ground for works of art, like Uncle Tom's Cabin, which could bring the emotional reality of it to the masses. Now that relationship, which comes first, Leonard Peikoff clarifies a bit more. So let me jump to question two. Leonard Peikoff was asked, elaborate on your statement that Plato and Aristotle might not have been possible without Homer and Sophocles. What qualities of poetry did this? And Leonard Peikoff answers, I was not thinking of them as poets, but of the worldview they presented. Now, talking of Homer now, the Greeks created the first literature in the West, as far as we know in the world, that was secular, essentially secular. Everything prior to that had been mystic, oriental, otherworldly, Egyptian, self-abasing of man in favor of another dimension. With Homer came this whole work out of the blue in which man was presented as greater, more glorious and more ideal than the gods. It was in its context a shocking degradation of the gods. Even the supreme god, Zeus, was ridiculed, seduced, and drugged by his wife. Right. The afterlife was explicitly condemned in the Odyssey. Right. In the Iliad, one of the characters says, my intellect is just as good as the gods. As to the gods, the only thing they have over me is physical force. Achilles, the great hero, was not just a warrior. He is presented as an intellectual, a wit, a musician, and as selfish. He mm. wanted his property or his woman back in the name of justice to him. In fact, in a very generalized way, the Iliad is the same story as Atlas Shrugged. The hero suffers injustice and then says, Spoiler alert, okay, I am going on strike. On strike. <laughs> Your battles without me. Right. It's just, it's just astounding that this should suddenly appear out of a human history, which is all completely the opposite. And, and Dr. Peikoff goes on, but he made the point in the first question, although Homer brought this uniquely out, this was already in the Greek culture. To some degree, the secularism was there, and Homer was the genius who brought it to literature. So again, it's not that we have you know the great man theory of knowledge where this person comes along and changes everything. He did change everything by taking what was growing in the culture already and turning it into these magnificent works. Exactly right. You know, there's so many ways you can express this. And he gave some great examples. Odysseus in the Odyssey travels down to the underworld, the world of the dead. And there he meets the great hero from the Iliad, Achilles. And Achilles explains to him that he would rather be a slave on earth than be king of the dead. You know, Odysseus is saying, gosh, you were the coolest guy on earth. You must be a real rock star down here <laughs> in the underworld. And Achilles says, no, my friend, it isn't. Achille uh, Odysseus sees the ghost of his mother, his recently dead mother. He tries to embrace his mother. Mm -hmm. Oof. He can't because, of course, she's just a spirit there. And that we see the miserable sort of shadowy, vague existence. You know, the afterlife is not what's important. Perhaps most, is, most uh, equally revealing is when Odysseus is fighting a battle 
and there's two people who come up to him begging for mercy because they're fighting on the other side. One is a priest, the other is a poet. Achilles kills the priest, or Odysseus kills the priest and spares the poet. Now, wow, what does that say <laughs> about Greek culture there? Uh, absolutely true that what's being said here and is most definitely when you read the my wife and i are listening to an audio version of uh richmond Lattimore's translation of homer's iliad and there can be no doubt that the focus of the iliad is about worldly matters uh about this earth um and the focus is all there you know, it's not just Homer who criticizes the gods. And in the Iliad, yes, Hera seduces Zeus, and it's placed to get him away from the battle so the Greeks can win. Uh, she's using her feminine wiles on Zeus, and it works. But, they, you know, it's not just Homer who's critical of the gods. It runs through so much of Greek literature. By the time you get to the Athenian playwright Euripides, his plays routinely criticize the gods. How dare Apollo? have taken advantage of this young woman. How dare the gods have put us in this situation? How unfair it was to this woman that the gods set up this situation. Euripides as a literary, uh, as a playwright, is an outright critic of the traditional gods of uh, Greece. This is a unique culture and it's a great literary expressions in Sophocles, Euripides and Homer all express the same secular approach to values uh, that Dr. Peikoff is talking about, and it's for real. Now, in the chat, Jeff Bannister is in with another super chat, and he has a comment with a question. He says, you would think it would be easy to write a popular book. And he <laughs> says, explain why Henry Dorn had such a tough time in The Simplest Thing in the World without spoilers, I suppose. That's a tough one to do without spoilers because... Without spoilers, yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't have a plot. It, it it has a, a a flow and a theme, yeah. but you know the climax is essentially the end of the story, and and it's it's boy that's I'm trying to think how would you describe this without spoilers? You, spoilers. You've got a writer who's who's clearly very intelligent and has great ideals, and he's been writing high literature to use that phrase uh, without much definition. And he realized that he, he can't get published. Nobody's interested in his work. And he's brilliant. So in theory, it should be easy to take that brilliance, scale it down, and write something popular, something simple, something, something that people would embrace and not get bogged down in this high literature he's producing, this, really these great works that he's capable of producing. But yeah, how do you, how do you get Howard Rourke to, to build a bank building? Much. Yeah, Ayn Rand, the advice Ayn Rand gave to young writers is very much the opposite. Do not try to write a bestseller. Do not try to please the crowd. Do not try to appease publishers. Do not try to, if you set out to write a bestseller, <laughs> you're probably hobbling yourself from actually being able to write a bestseller in but Ayn Rand. Wrote, but Ayn Rand wrote bestsellers. Or Alice Shrugged yeah. and the Fountainhead have sold millions. Her first super great success was The Fountainhead, which had been rejected by a dozen publishers to intellectual, to this, to that. You're I'm sorry, no one's going to buy these, these radical ideas of yours, Miss Rand. And so 12 publishers rejected <laughs> The Fountainhead as too original or too intellectual, in effect. And Ayn Rand still did not give up on it. And it became a huge bestseller. So uh, they Warner Brothers bought the movie rights for some huge amount of money uh, and put, made Gary, a Gary, big Gary Cooper movie out of it. So it was a huge success, appearing on the New York Times bestseller list years after it was first published. Now, how do you do that? Uh, by not setting out to appease the critics or the publishers or the masses or to write a bestseller. She was going to write the book she found interesting, characters she found absorbing. And I got to say, that's it. When I read an Ayn Rand novel, it's because I find the characters, unlike any characters I've ever read in any other story, they're interesting characters. She places them in interesting, dramatic situations, which reveal their characters in such vivid ways. That's why I read Ayn Rand's novels, is to get that sense, that sense uh, of things. So, yes. uh, yeah. 
uh, if you have something, especially if you're un an art creative artist, to the extent you're creative and saying something new, you have to believe that what you're saying in your connection with reality and the values you're trying to get out there. Uh, you you can't use other people's opinion because you'll just write the standard pulp, same old, same old, you know, like a romance novel, you know, a Barbara Carr led romance novel, the same plot over and over and over and over again. It's not really much art. Um, it's just a rehash of the same kind of thing. And there are people out there who like, you know, re reading the same story over and over again, but I find that kind of boring. It's uh, It reminds me of a scene in The Fountainhead in which Peter Keating is talking to Howard Rourke and uh, his his latest success. And, and Keating is telling Howard Rourke, you know, I love you, Howard Rourke. I really do. Um, and one of the things I love is that this kind of success that Peter Keating is achieving, this is not for you. You don't get it. And I love that about you. And yet he also loves that about his own success. It's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't translate. The great thing about Jeff Manister's question and that story, the simplest thing in the world, it isn't just about writers. The no. reason why Henry Dorn keeps trying to dumb down his ideas or think of what would be popular and keeps running into roadblock. He has a great idea. Okay, here's what would be popular. And then he follows, he thinks about it. He thinks about what would be interesting, what he wants to produce, <laughs> what he wants to put out there. And no matter how he tries, at one point, you know, he's like, oh yeah, what about the, 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 the woman who is, you know, is going to be this provide. Oh, to hell with that. I don't care about that. I've got this great idea. This is what I want to do. This thing I can do. A more but, original idea. But when Peter Keating He's says creative. to Howard Rourke, when Peter Keating says to Howard Rourke, this isn't for you. And I love that about you. What he's saying is not just you can't enjoy my kind of success. It, you literally couldn't experience. You can't think that way. You, you don't have a mind that even if you tried to follow it down that other path, you can't go there. And I think the simplest thing in the world makes that makes that point. It would take a longer story to really you know, make it visceral and you could see it. But you see that all throughout the fountainhead. You can't force if yourself you to writer, be less than you are. Right. If you were a good writer, the hardest thing in the world to turn the title on its head would be to be bad to be uncreative to be non-creative to give the standard pulp that someone expects um that would be in effect denying the whole motivation for being a writer in the first place he was a writer because he had something unique to say he had creative interesting plots he wanted to talk about <laughs> far more interesting than the junk that he knew would likely be easy to publish and that's what he's trying to do become successful now i have a friend who is a novelist and I have to say, one of his novels was a very creative attempt at writing, in effect, at violating Ayn Rand's rule, in effect. I'm going to set out to write a bestseller. Now, in the course of that, he smuggled in all kinds of creative ideas. In the course of that, he smuggled in even creative literary techniques that sort of would go under the radar screen of a standard you know, fiction thriller, uh, it had the surface of, uh, look of a, of a thriller, but if you go deeper, so that the book could be read on different levels. Uh, but even there, you see, he couldn't, you see, he sets out to write a bestseller <laughs> before he's done with it. He's saying radically, the villain is the environmentalist or the, you know, I'm going to do something so terribly uh, unconventional that people are going to be, whoa, this is not like anything I've ever read before. And I think that's the the curse and the, and the blessing that being a creative mind, a creative artist involves. Uh, you, 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 you try and set out to communicate and get through to his many people as possible but if to the extent you are good to the extent you are creative you're going to be doing something different you're going to be projecting your universe in a way that's never been done before to the extent you're a decent writer yes now that story the simplest thing in the world as you point out uh which jeff banister asks about is included it's not in the early ayn rand or her short story it's included in the romantic manifesto because it provides a brilliant example of exactly what she talks about in the book, that story is now available online through the courses on the Ayn Rand Institute. 
and our producer has included it in the chat. You'll see a link in there. Otherwise, you can search Google and find it as well. It's a story well worth reading. So thank you for that question, Jeff Bannister. We also have a super chat from Malk Sokowski, who's paying in Swedish krona, which means he's living an interesting life. I always love seeing, uh, again, where people are coming from around the world. And we have a generous super chat from Emmanuel, who says, very generously, he says, oh, truthfully, I... I love this. This is perfect because this leads right into our next question to Dr. Peekoff. Emmanuel says, truthfully, I don't read fiction often. My ideal fiction and art that projects values of ambition and drive, well, aside from Ayn Rand and movies like The Godfather, I haven't seen much art that projects those values, especially in fiction. Interesting. Question number, th I know we should answer your comment, Emmanuel, but I'm going to let a better man than myself do it. Question number three, Dr. Peikoff was asked, well, is it true that there is a tendency among objectivists to discount the importance of art and read nonfiction over fiction? Well, <laughs> yeah, was a great essentially example asked the same me. question. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Dr. Peikoff says, well, I think based on my experience, that there is some truth to this. As mm -hmm. people see it, well, they have, a, they have a choice between modern works and classics, and the modern is mostly junk, and the classics for most people are too long, too hard, and too different in setting. And those people want fiction that they can read with enjoyment. He says, I think another factor involved is that people compare any potential novel to the works of Ayn Rand <laughs> and say, well, this is no good. So I'm just going to give up the field. But that is a mistake. There are treasures in general fiction that aren't even romantic novels, but uh, let alone The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, but which are miles above TV, including yeah. the inspiration they provide, something nonfiction cannot give you. And then he says, and this is one for you to look up, if you have not heard or read this yet, I gave a lecture, Leonard Peikoff says, to which I'll refer you, titled The Survival Value of Great, Though Philosophically False, or the sur I'll repeat that, The Survival Value of Great, Though Philosophically False Art. And he says he used Dostoevsky and Tolstoy as examples. These two are certainly not benevolent or <laughs> romantic, although in a sense you could say Dostoevsky is a negative romantic. And reading them is certainly nothing like reading Ayn Rand. On the other hand, I think you get a real pleasure in its own way out of the tremendous purposefulness of the exactness of the writing, the fullness of the characters. I get great pleasure out of that, much more than reading nonfiction. Much more. And, and, and that to me is... You know, that, know. Just I that know. title, the survival yeah. value, it's not, that. Right. it's not the great value, the pleasure, the enjoyment, but literally the survival value, and I don't think that's an exaggeration, of great, though philosophically false art. Now, for those of us who don't find it in great literature, of course, we find it in other places, but but it really is a survival value to periodically reinforce and, and enter a universe of those ideas. You know, if I can quote Ayn Rand's um, play Ideal, which you can find in the early Ayn Rand, you know, a spirit needs fuel, and a spirit can run out of fuel. And just as I need food as a survival value, so I need spiritual fuel for my survival uh, to motivate me so that I can enjoy life, so I can see my experience, emotionally experience my deepest metaphysical values as a reality to keep me pursuing them in the long run. If I'm pursuing a multi-year goal, you know, whether it's three years, 10 years, or 20 years, uh, I need constant emotional reinforcement. Now, yes, uh, Holly, my wife, the love of my life is an important aspect of that fuel. My dear friends, are an important aspect of that fuel. P aspects of reality can be an important aspect of that fuel. But to really, you know, there's something unique about what art can do in terms of making a high philosophical abstraction so concretely and emotionally real that it is that value 
that is I'm experiencing in effect. Uh, the, and sometimes it is the critical message that I need, uh, not didactically, but emotionally, but emotionally. Um, and that's, I think, the big distinction between uh, nonfiction and fiction. I have known objectivists who, yeah, okay, I read Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, Virtue of Selfishness, Romantic Manifesto. Okay, new, new left, philosophy who needs it. I get it. I get her ideas. And at one level, you can get her ideas from reading that stuff. And, you know, in effect, after the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, she spent the rest of her life <laughs> explaining the philosophy that is implicit in those two novels in nonfiction essays, which with greater exactitude and precision explain those ideas. As Ayn Rand many times points out, a novel is not a textbook for philosophy or morality. It is, a, yes, it's a projection of our deepest metaphysical values, but it is not some philosophical textbook that's going to make all the proper definitions and all the correct distinctions, lay out the hierarchy of the development of our knowledge. No, 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 no. For that, we need nonfiction. We need philosophy. But none of that nonfiction can give me the emotional fuel. I, you know, you really have to think about it and then how will this affect my life? And I suppose that could give me emotion, but how far, you know, what a mental chain to get there. Whereas in a work of art, boom, right in front of me, I experience the concrete, I experience the, the value itself emotionally. And uh, I don't think nonfiction can be spiritual fuel. We were talking about the spiritual uh, last week, because the, the, the spirit is a much broader concept than just say cognition and to uh, appeal to the whole range of my psychology, my entire spirit, I need art. I need art. It comparatively nonfiction, while it is more fundamental and in one sense indispensable and in another sense more important because I got, I got my thinking straight first, all that being true, it cannot do what art does, which is of survival value, which is at least of equal value within the whole context of my soul, that emotional experience of my deepest values. Outstanding. There, there is a link in the chat uh, put up by our producer to that course, The Survival Value of Great Though Philosophically False Art. Now, that was originally presented as a lecture. It's uh, just under two hours long, but the course version on the Ayn Rand Institute's website that that link to, goes to also includes part one and part two, so almost three hours, of Leonard Peikoff's discussion, Poems I Like and Why. Now that title, Poems I Like and Why, it's so casual and, and kind of almost sweet. You, don't, you, you won't know until you listen to it. When Leonard Peikoff tells you why he likes a piece of poetry, we're talking about a rich explanation that will take these these great works and and make them even greater for you. So I heartily encourage you to follow that link in the chat to the Ayn Rand's version of this. It, again, set up as a course with all three of those parts, the survival of value of great though philosophically false art and poems I like and why. It brings to mind uh, Eight Great Plays, which Leonard Peikoff presents, the right. play version of the poems I like. You know, when and I they're so good, and it's so easy to think, well, this is art, it's kind of extra. No, no. Well, uh, when I was still participating in those uh, Saturday night sessions at Leonard Peikoff's uh, home, he was he, one of the last things I, I did there was read these great plays before he came out with this lecture. And he was planning this lecture and thinking about this lecture on great plays and stuff. But we got to read Antigone. We read Corneille and, you know, we read Shakespeare, Othello. We read these great plays and Dr. Peikoff, you know, we went through it. And in each case, we could knock out the philosophical errors like it was no problem. But then he would redirect us onto the values that are being projected there and how they're being dramatically projected and how they affect us. Um, poetry, another uh, wonderful interaction I had with Dr. Peikoff at this time. I had the chutzpah, I don't know where I got it, to announce one day that I had the objective definition of poetry. And he'd, oh, you tell a philosopher you've got an objective definition. Uh-huh, Jim, tell me what you're... And I explained, you know, my definition and so forth. And one of the proudest, I'm boasting, I'm going to boast. Uh, one of the proudest moments of my life was when after that discussion, he said, can I steal that definition? 
Ooh. and then I and then I later <laughs> saw it appear, and then I later saw that same idea of poetry appear not only in his discussion of poetry, but in the 75th anniversary introduction to Anthem. Okay. So I had this wonderful glow of pride with it. Uh, uh, so I definitely would urge people to check out both of those from Dr. Leonard Peikoff. It is not objectivist consistent art that we uh, should limit ourselves to. Um, and it's not even in that romantic sense like Victor Hugo, because he has values that are inconsistent with objectivism. I mean, step outside uh, our values altogether. Read Othello. Read Othello and tell me that you just don't get a chill up your spine with the en with the evil envy of, a of Iago. Read Antigone by Sophocles and tell me ev whatever her ancient religion and religious values were that were motivating her that an objectivist wouldn't agree with, tell me you're not inspired and moved and horrified with catharsis, as Aristotle would say, at the fate of Antigone. Um, no, all of those kind of things can be vital uh, emotional fuel, and too few objectivists uh, take advantage of that amazing value out there. You know, we can find examples of greatness in nonfiction, in history. Right. What we don't see, even though it's there, it's not part of the story. We don't always see the bravery. We don't always see courage. We don't always see passion in the way that art brings it to us. And we all need more of that in our lives. Right. Right. It's that emotional fuel. Uh, don't forget, you know, yeah, we're, you know, the mind, it's important to get our ideas straight. It's important, especially to get philosophy straight, because it under underlies everything else. All that is absolutely true. And there is no substitute for rational cognition. But rational cognition itself needs motivation. Rational cognition itself needs reward. And uh, we get that by experiencing emotionally our values as concretized by an artist, a great artist. Yeah, the, the happiness that is our goal in being rational and productive and honest and having integrity, the happiness is all too, it's quiet, it's personal, it's internal. It doesn't shine out of the friends and family and great people we know. It shines out of art. Art shows us you can do this, you can experience this, you can have a piece of this. Uh, again, art uh, does something that nothing else does. Let me, um, uh, where was I? Oh, I wanted to give the, the ending of our question number three about objectivists choosing nonfiction over fiction, because I don't want, hey, Manuel is in the chat here saying, Peekoff is about to lay the hammer on me. And then he says, actually, Peekoff did lay the hammer on me. <laughs> Leonard Peekoff wraps up his answer by saying. Oh, he's laid hammers on me before, I can tell you, and in person. <laughs> but I've grown every time from it. <laughs> and I want that, just like you know, I want the yes. data to <laughs> drill. I, I say thank you, yes. <laughs> yes, please, please fix that. Right. And he says, you might say, I want to get my artistic fulfillment from some other arts like music or painting or whatever. And Leonard Pigoff says, there's nothing whatsoever wrong with that. You certainly don't have to give up fiction. I just think personally you're missing out on a lot if you do. Right. So, so again, this is, this is not intended to be judgmental. This is simply useful. It's powerful and it's true. He says, I think the one probable reason over and above what I've said for people giving up on fiction is that they've given up reading. As a result of American schooling, so much is visual. Email is basically sentence fragments. Text messaging makes even email look like Shakespeare. <laughs> it's becoming a non-linguistic culture, and therefore reading of any kind that is not mandatory for factual information is something people don't want, something I think is a bad sign. But I do say that if you don't like it, there's nothing immoral about not doing it yeah it, it's 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 yeah, un, right. unquote leonard pigoff it's just a massive missed opportunity right 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 i mean uh, i would say if they're aware of this issue it would be immoral to ignore an important value that they could have I, i'm an egoist get everything you can out of life don't, don't let anything that's important you go by uh you want the most on the other hand i wouldn't call it a moral issue if they don't know they can't experience that. But there, I would just encourage people to go read a bunch of fiction, read different fiction, read detective stories, 
read. You know, there's so much out there in literature that while it's not, you know, philosophically creative, it's still a wonderful emotional fuel. Uh, in fact, we may philosophically disagree with aspects of it. Um, you know, a friend of mine just read to me the, the a bestseller they turned into a movie that was much inferior called Ender's Game, science fiction about a little boy uh, who, in effect, saves the world from alien invasion. It was a spoiler alert. Uh, I had tears coming down my my face reading a when a book was read to me that I philosophically had some significant disagreements with. And yet, despite those philosophical disagreements, there was something that the author was chiming into that had me in tears, moved, moved profoundly uh, by this, in effect, science fiction uh, book aimed at youth. And it still was emotional fuel for me. So please, people, keep reading and it keeps your mind working and it keeps that evaluative mechanism, which is the whole function of art, nice and greased and oiled, a very, very important thing. Yeah. Um, sometimes people who are just nonfiction people, you know, they start reflecting that dry, they start losing that motivation, that passion. And you got to keep that spark alive, folks. And yeah. nothing can do that better than great literature. And, and I've got to say to, to folks who don't feel this, let me tell you, and you won't feel it, and you might not agree with it, but you'll remember this and maybe test it. When you consume great art, it's not because, well, you should consume great art and you'll get something out of it. It is an end in itself. It is a pleasure. Right. I have a standing, you know, people, there's a common question in podcasting. People will say, what's your most gifted book? What have you given out the most often as a gift? And, uh, you know, now we have the free books program, so we don't need to give out copies of the Fountainhead. But my most gifted book is the um, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, Rostand's Cyrano, and, 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 okay. the, and the Brian Hooker that's a, translation. That's a great choice, Mr. Nasser. <laughs> you, you, picked, you picked one of my all-time favorites on just a purely emotional level, just a purely spiritual fuel level. Man, it is does such that play do it for me. It is I mean, such a joy, wow. a pleasure, an inspiration. It and it's, you know, I could say it feels like a command to rise to be a better man, but it's not it that makes it sound like a burden, and it's not. It's an inspiration. Right. It's 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 just fuel, like like jet fuel for jet being fuel. a better man. And it's been my to friends and family, it's been my open offer that I will give anybody a copy of that book. Tell me right. you have any interest in it, and I will. And if you're not local, I'll you know go to Amazon. I will order you, know, you one I, in I'm a heartbeat. A I'm a big fan, as I've said here, Sophocles, uh, Shakespeare, uh, take a, a more modern uh, Ibsen. I think they were all brilliant, genius playwrights. Uh, and Ayn Rand uh, even wrote, uh, produce, she, uh, one of her plays was produced on Broadway and was a success. And she wrote other plays that you can find in the early Ayn Rand. Uh, but, and I will include Ayn Rand's plays in this. I think Cyrano de Bergerac is the greatest play ever written, even when I have my slight philosophical questions about that. And I know Lisa Van Dam will correct me on some of that and get me to a better view pl place on that. But even if I, even in my old state where I thought, okay, there's a philosophical disagreement here, that is comparatively irrelevant to the tremendous emotional like you say, jet fuel, that is Cyrano de Bergerac. It is one of the most amazing experiences of, your, of my life to be able to read it or to see it performed on stage. Um, amen, brother uh, Robert. It, it It's just, it's one of the greatest gifts we've ever received. Uh, yeah. Jeff Bannister is in the super chat generously again and says, <laughs> I had heard the term loose cannon many times when someone referred to me. <laughs> <laughs> well loose cannon what, is, what does that even mean we hear that a lot and he goes on to say i never had it expressed better than it was in 93 on the ship by victor hugo right wow what what is a loose Whoa. cannon on a rolling on a rolling ship rolling Whoa. yes what will a loose cannon do right but you know i think uh many of us fans of ayn rand are probably used to being all those cannons when we're the very opposite. We are the law, the logical reality grounded cannons. 
Uh, but we're because our ideas are so radical, we we just have to get over the idea that people are going to call us crazy in various forms. <clears throat> I would like to think most of us are properly chained to the deck. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jeff. Let me jump to question number four, and we'll see if we get all five of these in. There's so much, so many good insights here. I've made notes yeah. here I haven't even gotten to. But question number four, because this is something to watch out for and something our, our nonfiction fans might accuse some of us of, can reading Ayn Rand ever be escapism? rather than legitimate refueling. Okay, well, obviously it's gonna depend a little on what we mean by escapism. Leonard Peikoff answers, anything can be escapism, if by that you mean getting away from the dull, depressing scene around you to something better. For instance, sex can be escapism, and perfectly <laughs> legitimately so. Right. Uh, and it's very common Oh, in bomb shelters, he says. Well, that, that's interesting. Bomb shelters are, are a little before my generation, but I remember them. I remember. And the idea that, yeah, when you are... Uh... Well, anyway, let me let me read Leonard Peikoff's answer here. For instance, sex can be escapism, and perfectly legitimately so, in bomb shelters. And it's very common there because people think they're going to die at any minute. Hmm. Music can be escapism. <laughs> that's Living the classic escape. situation. Right. I mean, you only have so yeah. much time. What well, are you going to do? <laughs> we, we've got, we, may, we may only have hours left to live. Right. How shall we wrap up this? Uh... Right. How do you want to go out? Right. <laughs> uh, oh, they're having fun with that in the chat. Christopher Smith says, that's why I built mine. Music can be escapism. <laughs> having a steak when everything is awful can be escapism. And then he says, I think the real question is, right. What is the bad sense of escapism? In other words, the refusal to face reality, an act of evasion. I would say in the sense that Ayn Rand is a romantic, it is not an escape because she's a romantic realist. But it is escapist. It is bad just to read and reread and reread her, turning away from the world, living a meaningless life and just coming alive only when you read her. Well, you've given up then. You've right. tired of reality. You've taken her as a substitute, not as a fuel for moving on, but as a world in which you can stand still. So I would say don't do that. Well, for a short while, this is Leonard Peikoff, for a short while, when you're young, well, it's okay. When I was 16, I just read the Foundnet over and over and over again and didn't do anything else because, well, I had no idea what to do. And I did not want the world around me. I got to finally memorize the book, but I came out of that. I wouldn't do that as a continuous way of life. I have to admit, I can quote long passages from the Fountainhead just from memory. And uh, I, I hope it's, I, I never really, you know, completely lost myself in the book. I've just read it so many times. I, but know, I've seen, again, I've seen that and I've, you know, even experienced a little bit of it. You know, the thing is, is that fiction can be escapism because it's escapism from reality. I mean, I think that a lot of people, and we have examples in the last century, of course, the rise of fat, purely fantasy literature, such as J.R.R. Tolkien's. Um, if you, uh, there are people who read that stuff precisely because it is not this reality. Um, it, and it takes them away from that. But whatever value there is to Tolkien is obviously there aren't elves and dwarves and magical swords and whatnot, <laughs> dragons. Uh, it's the metaphor, the allegory that Tolkien always said his book wasn't a moral allegory. If it's not a moral allegory for your life, uh, then what is the point of all these dragons and elves and so forth? That stuff can be pure escapism because it's escapism from reality. When I read Ayn Rand, it's strange because it's not reality I'm escaping from. It's the foggy minds of other writers that I'm escaping from. It's, as I said earlier, she reading Ayn Rand is the difference between the style of Vermeer and Rembrandt. She gives me this sense of hyper-reality, ultra-clarity. The, the light makes it all perfectly. She, you know, it highlights the vivid reality of what's going on. You know, Vermeer will always have a big sun-infused window on one side, and it will give this hyper-clarity um, to his paintings. And in that sense, it's reading Ayn Rand is not escapism. Now, do I like to live in the world of Ayn Rand's values? I absolutely do. I'd like to live in 
the world of her metaphysical values and what she regards as important, that, that doesn't mean it's an escape for me. Quite the opposite. I feel like I'm returning to a clearer view of reality when I, so it's the real, it is the realism part of the romantic realism. You see, romanticism in its extreme form can lose touch, cut anchor with reality. And I think that does become the motive for some people just to get away from anything that they know. Now, in one sense, your boring life around you, there's nothing wrong with getting away from that and considering and contemplating as an end in itself, something more interesting. That by itself is not escapism. That by itself is not escapism. What are you escaping? What I'm escaping when I read an Ayn Rand novel is the fuzzy unclarity of other writers thinking. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Well, speaking of escapism, and one final question here. Incidentally, our producer reminds us, if you're enjoying this show, please give it a like. Click the thumbs up button on YouTube. That is going to help more people see the show. It'll show up in more people's feeds, and that that is greatly appreciated by us. If you like it enough, share the show. Click that share button. You'll get a link. Easy ways to share it to people. More people will have the opportunity to enjoy the discussions that we are having here today. And I'm going to wrap up that discussion with question number five, because Leonard Peikoff was asked, is it wrong or irrational to identify with someone like a character in a novel? Well, if it's wrong, I don't want to be right. I know. <laughs> I always say, I want to be Howard Rourke when I grow up. If that right. ever happens. Exactly. <laughs> so Leonard Peikoff We answers. don't literally mean an, an orange-haired architect. Oh, right. You know? Well, I, but, but I think we, if we've been in objectivism long enough, we've seen those extremes. Not necessarily right. of dyeing their hair, but of people dropping what it was they were interested in and saying, right. oh, I should be an architect. Right, right. We or have dye their orange. <laughs> and dye their hair. Why not? Why not? Lord knows my hair has been multiple colors before. Leonard Peikoff started his answer to this. He said, identifying with a character simply means, well, that you see some important similarity between you and that character in their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions. And it's not always so. You may read a book with great characters or bad characters and not feel any similarity. But sometimes a character is drawn in such a way that you think, wow, we have a lot in common. Even if you have big differences, that doesn't change the fact that the similarities are real and you identify with them. That is perfectly rational. You're simply responding to a fact. It's certainly not wrong to grasp your similarity to another character. When I read The Fountainhead as a young teenager, I definitely identified with the character Dominique, the common denominator, which I didn't really know at the beginning, was that we both had two qualities. We were both idealists and we were both bitter, bitter at the hopelessness of ever achieving ideals in the world. The latter had been pounded into me when I was very young, so I could certainly sympathize with that viewpoint. I knew that Rourke was right, but I didn't feel that he was right. Of course, I didn't come to do that until I learned from Ayn Rand at the end of the book, what Dominique's and my error was, close quote Leonard Peikoff. And the, the power of the character Dominique, who has been argued about and misunderstood and uh, I love I love Mark Pellegrino's reaction to her. He's, he would right. never put up with any of that from a woman. Right, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like a toxic woman to me. Right? <laughs> and yet that character is 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 so powerful. It is you know Ayn Rand said her in a bad mood, but it's any of us in a bad and bad mood doesn't mean bad mood. Uh, any of us in moments where we have a bad view of the world, of life, of what's out there, of what people are and our chances of fighting against it. We, I think we've all been Dominic at some point. Mark cites Don Watkins' brilliant comments on this. It's not really that uh, Dominique is out to destroy Howard Rourke. She's actually out to save him from the world. And when you grasp that, she has this sense of the sanctity and importance of 
Howard Rourke's work to such a degree that she can't, as it's so beautifully said in the Fountainhead at one point, she can't stand the idea of someone ha hanging their dirty laundry in front of the Stoddard Temple, one of Howard Rourke's buildings. It's a sacrilege, you see. <laughs> or she's, she'd rather it not have never have come into existence rather than see someone hang their dirty laundry in front of it. Whereas to Howard Rourke, of course, that doesn't matter at all. The fact that it stood, even if it was later corrupted, the fact that it once stood was enough for him. Wow. Yes. Wow. Now, if I think about identifying with a character, there are characters I identify with literature, even well beyond objectivist literature. But if I were to do it with objectivist literature, I would I did not identify, I have to say, with Dominique. I'm more like Mark in the sense that she was a puzzle for me to figure out. Uh, no doubt about it. Atlas Shrugged is where I found, and I'm talking about differences. I had no desire to be uh, run a transcontinental railroad, <laughs> to be a railroad engineer, or to be a woman. <laughs> and yet, the character that I most identify, I think, in all of Ayn Rand's literature is Dagny Taggart. It's her sense of opt. It's her mistake that I was making. It's her over optimism, her projection of her own psychology onto people. Uh, by mistake, they're not always as benevolent as you are, Dagny. They don't all love life. Um, so the lesson that Dagny, so it's not the lesson Dominique has to learn in The Fountainhead. It was the lesson Dagny had to learn in the in Atlas Shrugged that hit home with me. I And it was only reality. It, Atlas Shrugged told me I need to be aware of that, to be on alert to that, because you're a little too uh, over-optimistic about what people can be, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, so uh, it, it was the lesson, and life actually is what taught me the Dagny Taggart lesson. I went out and became a prosecutor. I had personal relationships with people. It was all these other experiences in life that really drove home, and studying history, drove home the message to me that, yeah, there are people out there who hate the good for being the good. They don't love life. They just fear death. And so, boom, it, it, reality hit me, and I came back around, and I realized, yeah, Dagny Taggart was me, this over-optimistic, over-innocent American type who thought that surely if, if I could just convince, and that's the way I am, all I have to do is a little more. I could just show them and I can prove to them. I could explain to them and they'll understand. Just do, let me do a little more work and they'll get it. Not realizing that not everyone even has that minimum level of benevolence. They won't get it. They don't love their life. And that's a hard one. If you do love your life, that's a hard one to wrap your head around. But I am fully convinced of the reality of that now from my own experience. And it was Atlas Shrugged that sort of nudged me there because I had to learn the lesson of Dagny, not the lesson of Dominique as Leonard did. Does that make sense? It does, it does. I have to admit that, I forget who was accused once, uh, there was a conversation between intellectuals and uh, you might remember this sequence. Somebody said, well, your, your problem is you don't believe in evil. And I think sometimes that's my problem is that I know that, you know, Dewey, for example, in American education, in the early 1900s was evil, but I still keep coming back. Well, but what did he believe that made him do what he did? It's, it's, so I know that feeling of, of sometimes it's hard for me to believe in evil. And then I look at literature and I see, well, there are Tuies out there and there are Stadlers out there. And it, it, it helps. It helps me to actually grasp the fact of evil. The case of Dominique is interesting. I love Bernstein, yeah, Andrew but, Bernstein's yeah, talk uh, description about of uh, Dominique. And he, he loves her. He thinks when she's oh, one yeah. of the greatest characters yeah, of well. literature. And her approach to Howard Rourke is, he calls it a mercy killing. Essentially, she loves him so much that she's right. going to let the world destroy him. Right. If he's going to be destroyed, it's going to be by somebody who loves him. Right. You know, she pleads with him, please let me take you away from the controversies of art. We'll just live an ordinary little life someplace quietly together. We, we can share these exquisite values together and not be damaged or affected by the world. Um, yeah. In effect, she's trying to protect, in the only way she knows how, Howard Rourke from a world she thinks is hopeless. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be an architect, I have to destroy you myself because the world won't let you do that. Yeah, exactly. The world, is, the world yeah. is going to do the worst things to you. So I'm going to do them first. If you're going right. to be destroyed, it's going to be by somebody who loves you. Ah, such a great story. Well, yeah. James, I, I think, I think we have um, 
covered several important points here. I hope we've encouraged people who haven't found much richness in considering fiction to to reconsider that and to take it more in. I have one last thought, if I must. Yes. I think that the point Peacock makes here is a brilliant one. It is philosophy. It is the it is Ayn Rand's radical and powerful discoveries in philosophy that are going to save the world, but they are not going to save the world by themselves. They the way we are going to save the world is by communicating those ideas in a way like Ayn Rand did through art. I believe that it is literature and art that will culturally lead us out to a new renaissance. Yes, it presupposes a certain philosophy, but philosophy by itself is not going to change history. For if we really want objectivism to change our culture and change our world, the cutting edge is artists. And they're the ones who are going to lead us out of this state of intellectual and cultural bankruptcy that we find ourselves in. You know, that's a great point. I think the Ayn Rand Center UK there's so much more we can and so much more we're going to do. But yes, at some point, we need those objectivist artists. We need people like, for example, Jacqueline Schumann and and, and her partner who are writing a, a modern version of Atlas Shrugged for a, as a teleplay. The reason I mention that is because coming up in less than an hour on yes. the Iron <laughs> Center UK will be a discussion with Mark Pellegrino and Jacqueline Schumann and yourself, James Valiant, because I know you're going to be discussing a topic that requires a legal expert, and you're certainly the man for the job. Some folks may have heard the, the discussion last week about this, Kane Velasquez, uh, UFC fighter, ex-fighter, and he's now doing professional West wrestling just got out of eight months in jail on bail for the attempted murder of a man accused of molesting his four-year-old son. Oof. And from the show description, what can his possible defense be? And what does he need to prove in court in order to be found innocent of the charge? Is there a case for vigilantism? I mean, emotionally, we have to have sympathy for the... I mean, if you were the parent of a four-year-old you believed had just been molested a hundred times, Wow! Uh, you know, on the other hand, he goes and shoots up a car in the, in the street. So and you can't have that. So have that. what's so, the answer? Well, if you want to know what the answer is or what some of the <laughs> answers are, you can find out in less than an hour at 6 p.m. UK time, 1 o'clock Eastern time, 10 o'clock uh, your time, James, on the left coast, the west coast. Uh, I, that's going to be a compelling discussion. Again, I, I appreciated the discussion last week. I want to hear more. You know, I'm sure you're going to find me in the chat making some noise as well. So folks, stay tuned to the Ayn Rand Center UK. And again, if you're not already a member, click the link at the top of our chat. You can do that. Any super chats you put in, thank you so much to the people who super chatted during our show, any of them that you put in on this show, and especially on that episode, they all go to the Ayn Rand Center UK to support outstanding program like this. James, you have really risen to the challenge as we lost one of our one of our greats, Rukka Rukka Ali, has gone on to other aspects of his intellectual journey. And although we miss him, some of the shows since then has have as been you all really listen to the challenge. Mark, I think, is picking up the slack in such a wonderful way. And I really enjoy our conversations. And I think Jax's involvement has really uh, made the conversations much more interesting. So I, you know, I, I the daily objective is not to be uh, missed these days, folks. <laughs> I always rail against cliches, and I hate the expression, take it to another level. But I've got to say, the, the, the TDOs over the last couple of weeks have really been a cut above. And so I'm looking forward to this discussion, folks. Uh, 52 minutes away. Join for that. James, thank you for this discussion today. We've talked about philosophy and literature before. It's always interesting to me to consider which is primary and return to the idea that, well, philosophy is primary. Philosophy is the driver of history, but it is circular. It is spiral. It is constantly mutually reinforcing. Our greatest philosophers were reporting on their ideas that arose out of the culture of their time. The great originators were, were taking in the facts Reality ultimately is the ultimate fact, and that's why I believe in progress. I believe there's a reason why a great thinker like Ayn Rand could only have arisen in the 20th century, and it's the responsibility of the rest of us to both make our lives as good as they can be and to carry that forward. James, thank you for an outstanding discussion. Thank you, my dear friend. This was, this was insightful and fun. We will be back next week, next Wednesday, for another Peak Off Wednesday. In the meantime, I will see you all in less than an hour. 
watching the daily objective. Take care.